I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. Here I'm going to be talking about ABA Model Rule 1.12, which is about the conflicts of interest faced by former judges, arbitrators, mediators, and other types of third-party neutrals. Sometimes we have situations where a former judge returns to private practice of law and wants to represent clients. A number of states have elected state court judges, so sometimes they've lost an election and they go back to being a lawyer because they didn't win uh, re-election for their seat. Also, in the federal system, federal magistrate judges sometimes um, are appointed for a term of years, and some of them actually don't like being a magistrate judge and after one or two terms return to private practice. And of course, arbitrators and mediators may do what they were doing for a while and then decide to start representing clients um, as an advocate. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here. 1.12a says, except as stated in paragraph D, a lawyer shall not represent anyone in connection with a matter in which the lawyer participated personally and substantially as a judge or other adjudicative officer or law clerk to such a person or as an arbitrator, mediator, or other third-party neutral, unless all parties to the proceeding give informed consent confirmed in writing. Now, that's a really poorly drafted run-on sentence. What they're really saying is, if you're the judge for a case and then you step down or you lose re a re-election bid or something like that, or an arbitrator or even the judge's clerk, if you're personally involved in adjudicating a case, you can't turn around and represent one of the parties as the proceedings continue. Let's move on to 1.12b. A lawyer shall not negotiate for employment with any person who is involved as a party or as a lawyer for a party in a manner in which the lawyer is participating personally and substantially as a judge or other adjudicative officer or as an arbitrator, mediator, or other third-party neutral. In other words, we don't want a situation where the judge in a case realizes that they're not going to be a judge for much longer, either because they're stepping down or they are not going to win re-election. So they call counsel to chambers and say, hey, are either of your firms hiring? I hope you can see the conflict of interest there that if you were appearing before a judge, it would be awkward if that judge were also trying to get a job with your firm. You might feel that the judge is favoring you or favoring the other side if they are working on finding a spot for the judge at their firm and so forth. Now, I mentioned in a previous lecture that we're going to have a special rule for judicial clerks. So a lot of people will clerk for a judge it's no, usually right after law school, but it doesn't have to be. And federal clerkships are typically two years uh, for federal district court. A lot of the magistrate judge clerkships in the federal system are one-year clerkships. But we have this rule with the second part of 1.12b that says, a lawyer serving as a law clerk to a judge or other adjudicative officer may negotiate for employment with a party or a lawyer involved in a matter in which the clerk is participating personally and substantially, but only after the lawyer has notified the judge or other adjudicative officer. So the situation here, we have a relaxed rule for the clerks because typically these are temporary positions for a year or two, and then the assumption is the clerk is going to go into private practice and work at a firm somewhere. So a lot of them, if they don't have a firm holding a spot for them, are going to have to be on the job market applying for jobs in the last few months or last year of their clerkship. And so we can't really avoid that. We don't want to make them not be able to try to have a, another job lined up and until after their clerkship ends. So they're allowed to, to interview with firms and so forth, but they need to notify the judge that they, let's say, ha have applied to a firm that has a matter before the judge or that they have an interview or a job offer. And what will often happen is the judge at that point will take them off of the cases that involve that firm. Let's move on to 1.12c. And this is about the imputation of the conflict of interest 
to others after a judge has stepped down and gone to affirm. C says, if a lawyer is disqualified by paragraph A, in other words, they it's a case where they were at some point formerly the judge or arbitrator on it, then no lawyer in a firm with which that lawyer is associated may knowingly undertake or continue representation in the matter unless. So this is our classic imputation of conflicts of interest like we have seen under Rule 1.10 and 1.11. And it, so a judge, if they worked on a case, the firm can't represent one of the parties in that case if the judge now is no longer a judge but is working for that firm. And then in C1 and C2, we have the unless, and this is basically going to be screening procedures. If the disqualified lawyer is timely screened from any participation in the matter and is apportioned no part of the fee therefrom, and I have a picture here of lawyers with the... Oh, classic, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Basically, screening means you're not allowed to hear about or discuss or read files related to the matter, nor is anyone allowed to um, read your material or listen to you or talk to you about the case. C2 says written notice is promptly given to the parties and appropriate tribunal. So you're going to notify the other party and the judge in the case that, hey, we have this former judge who did some work, was involved in the case at an earlier stage in the proceedings, and is now a lawyer in our firm, but we are uh, screening the person. Rule 1.12d is about a situation that's pretty rare. I would be surprised if you encountered this in practice. An arbitrator selected as a partisan of a party in a multi-member arbitration panel is not pro prohibited from subsequently representing that party. Now, most arbitration has one arbitrator, but sometimes you'll have a situation where there's a panel and each side gets to pick um, one of their favorites, and then maybe there's a, th a, th a third one who's truly neutral. Well, if you were picked by one of the firms and then the other opposing counsel got to pick their member of the panel, then it's a, a partisan, you're there to represent the um, firm that picked you, there you were picked for a reason, even though, of course, you're going to try to be fair. And so, essentially, this rule wouldn't apply in that case. Now, in the comments to Rule 1.12, there's some important definitions that we should talk about or students should be aware of, especially in case you encounter questions, multiple choice questions about this on the MPRE or on my final exam. The definite how we're defining the terms in this rule can really matter. First, the term personally and substantially participating signifies that a judge who was a member of, let's say, a multi member uh, uh, appellate court, right? So, uh, courts of appeals usually have panels of three judges or more, and thereafter left judicial office to practice law is not prohibited from representing a client in a matter pending in the court but in which the former judge did not participate. So to give an example, let's say you have a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals judge, and, well, they are kind of scrambled up, right? There's a number of them, but three out of the group, it's typically 12, will be on any given panel. So if you were technically a Fifth Circuit judge, but you weren't on the panel for a case, then that doesn't count as participating personally and substantially, even though the Fifth Circuit made a decision about it, but you weren't involved in the panel for that case. What about a, a former, an adjudicative officer? The term adjudicative officer includes judges pro tempore, referees, special masters, hearing officers, and other parajudicial officers. So this could be, um, if you were routinely appointed as a special master, um, we some areas of law, we will have referees and so forth. These other titles, basically, you're appointed to work on a case and to resolve an issue as a third party neutral. Well, then you can't represent one of the parties in that same case later on. Um, going back to the issue of participating personally and substantially, we have a comment about former administrative judges. So most courthouses have a chief administrative judge um, who basically is responsible for some of the docketing details and maybe 
um, figuring out which judges have um, a lighter docket right now than others so they can assign more cases to them. So this judge is involved in the case in the sense typically uh, of involved in every case that comes through the courthouse, but mostly in terms of assigning the case to other judges to actually conduct the trial or uh, oversee the proceedings. So in that situation, a former judge could serve as a lawyer in a matter where the judge had previously exercised remote or incidental administrative responsibility that did not really affect the merits. One more comment that's worth talking about is comment two, that just is a reminder that there are other ethical codes for arbitrators and mediators and so forth, and those may impose more stringent standards of personal or imputed disqualification. Now, you're not responsible for those in my course, except a little bit of the code of judicial conduct. And um, you won't be tested on those, um, like a mediator code or arbitrator code on the MPRE, but for going into practice, you should be aware that those are out there and that those would also apply. Here's a quick review question just to see if you've been paying attention. Let's say a magistrate judge reaches the end of her term on the bench and returns to private law practice. She needs some new clients, so when one of the pro se litigants who previously appeared before her when she was a magistrate contacts her seeking representation for the ongoing litigation in the matter, and she immediately agrees to provide representation to that person, is this proper under Rule 1.12? Yes or no? This is supposed to be an easy question. If you're not sure about the answer, you might not have been paying attention and should rewatch this video. And that concludes our quick overview or review of Model Rule 1.12.